it's so great to be here with this group because <coughs> I often speak about how all this excitement that we had going in the Hoover Computer Club and the early days of talking about how we were going to revolutionize society with technology and all I was good at was being a good technologist and a very shy one. But when you have exciting people around, I don't like to like think about, well, I'm going to design something for all these millions of people in the world to write a book. I like to think about the people that I'm like hands-on touching, talking with every day. And you know, you roll off an idea. What if a computer was like this? I get an idea. I want to show it off. It's really to the close people. And, uh, Chris and Randy were so young back in those days. And Daniel's very young. Came along just a little later after the uh, we got started with the Apple One. And it was just those sort of people that you talk off and you feel your ideas have some value and merit in the world. And there's other people saying, wow, what a great product. This is really going to you know, help change the world. So it's good to be here with this group. And you're still shy. And, um, <laughs> and, I'm, still, and I'm still very shy in uh, like most social situations. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Um, yeah, it is great to uh, be here. Yeah, it is great to be here. Definitely one of the starting out the best things ever. ever. Uh, best best things ever. ever. school when we met him. Chris was very young in high school. But these guys were like so young that their minds were open and they spotted, whoa, the sort of thing that Waz is doing, you know, just a certain number of chips that you can actually count on a board is a whole computer right to a programming language. Now, it was just so inspiring that the young people would see it and get interested. They had that energy that kind of pushes you, you know, wow, let's try this. Why don't we do this? Why don't we, you know, a lot of that movement in there. Um, so it's kind of nice to be with them. And Chris, God, I remember the, the night you stayed at Apple writing some software demos and we've gotten a lot of trouble. I never even thought about it myself. Yeah, um, thanks, Buzz. Uh, it was really interesting being um, 14, 15 years old and having as my hobby, uh, hanging out with guys who would turn out to have been the founders of a major technical revolution and, and an entire industry that transformed certainly our way of life around here and not just around uh, or and around the world. Uh, but coming home at six in the morning uh, after staying out all night and getting uh, put on suspension by your parents um, is, you know, a common experience for a lot of kids, but um, very few did it uh, writing uh, graphics output subroutines with WAS. <laughs> and that was, I think, the only suspension I got when I was in high school. But uh, it was, I really didn't know, and I don't think uh, uh, Randy did either, that this wasn't the way that 14-year-olds, you know, did things when they were in high school. You got a hobby, you found some friends, they started a small business. I mean, I was in junior achievement. That's what they were telling you was going to happen. You start a small company and it grows. Well, I've been there 30 years now. Um, uh, the reason I'm there is that in 1981, I'd gone off to college uh, to get a uh, degree in English literature because everybody told me that I wouldn't get a good job unless I had a, a college degree. I, I saw Waz and Jobs, and they were both dropouts, and I didn't want to end up like them. Um, <laughs> and so Jobs called me up one day and said, I want you to come be the publications manager for Macintosh. Listening carefully, it will only take a year. <laughs> and I'll pay your tuition to finish college when we're done. Um, I'm still waiting. <laughs> uh, it was nice to see also, um, uh, Weiss's uh, um, demonstration of, well, of the first Apple One um, that was up on the projector, and I remember that so deeply. It was a way that um, I felt like she was doing stuff, taking around, rolling around a PP11 or something to schools, and showing fourth graders how computer software is a set of steps written by humans. And I thought, wow, how great that I can contribute to technology and to young kids' education. So I actually donated the first Apple One to her. And then Steve Jobs came and he made me pay 300 bucks for it. That was my apartment. <laughs> so it wasn't that easy. But, um, um, you know, it was great because uh, uh, we went up to the PC76 show. And they, we had a picture up there of Steve Jobs with Daniel Cockney, who I'll pass the mic to. And I was actually in a room in the hotel working away trying to finish up basics so I could be like uh, Bill Gates. <laughs> well, it's a... Uh... 
pretty surrealistic to be here three years later. Um, you know, uh, my history was I went, grew up in Pelham, New York, in a high school that had no electronics, wasn't even a radio shack in town. I remember trying to build a walkie-talkie kit in high school and just had, did not know anyone else who was interested at all. And so my interest in electronics just completely faded. And uh, I became a friend with Steve Jobs at college, at Reed, over Eastern literature. And Steve never talked about the blue box activities that he was doing with you was. Never talked about it at all, which surprised me later because I would have been interested. And he never talked about electronics at all. Uh, and so then, uh, summer of 76, I came out to visit, not for any particular reason, but Steve was already doing the Apple One. So uh, I can clearly remember my first day arrived at the Jobs house. Uh, Steve's younger sister, Patty, was in the living room watching television. She was watching the Gong Show, in fact, <laughs> plugging the chips into the Apple One on the coffee table. <laughs> so actually, it was the coffee table stage in the living room. Uh, and I thought, well, God, I could do that. And uh, so then I took over that job right away. Like, <laughs> I wasn't really into the Gong Show, but I was really interested in electronics. Didn't, didn't, did not have a clue how that stuff worked. So I spent a good deal of that summer uh, reading Interface Age magazine yeah, and yeah, reading, reading the 6502 inspection manual, which I could not make any sense out of. But um, I tried. Well, Dan was hitting on a subject too, which is the garage. Well, the garage was um, a, a nomer from Hewlett and Packard starting their garage and they had their whole company there. But really, we didn't have a telephone in the garage. Steve ran the business from his bedroom you know, and from the other parts of the house, calling distributors, calling magazines, calling part suppliers, and all the engineering that was done in my cubicle at HP or my apartment. And the garage, though, was so close to our hearts because it was the place that we brought people. We had one lap bench set up, and we could plug the computers together and do a final test before we drove them down to the store to get paid cash. But we'd bring people in and give the demos and talk there. And it was like sort of like the, a nice, warm place to meet people because it had a little bit of space, and the rest of the house was always kind of crowded. Um, let's see. Uh, I first started working in the garage in um, December of 76. Uh, I met Waz and Jobs at the Homebrew Computer Club. Uh, our mutual teachers at Homestead High School, uh, Steve Headley on the uh, computer side, and uh, John McCullough on the electronic side, who um, always spoke very highly of you, Waz, and not so much of Steve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, uh, warned me to, to keep my distance from the both of you, but thought it would be okay if I learned a little from you because you'd have actually gotten jobs, which was good. Um, and so after um, learning to program the Apple One at the, the bike shop in Palo Alto, where they, they paid me handsomely in uh, two Michael's magazines for writing, for demo, writing programs. demo programs for them, um, I ran into jobs one day there and he said, would you like to come test the ROM software in the Apple II before we ship it? And so I spent my um, my December break of my of uh, my sophomore year in high school sitting in the garage, which didn't have heat that I recall, uh, <laughs> testing uh, integer basic before you burned it into the Apple II ROM, and that was when I started first working in the garage. Yes, I do remember those codes then. Um, also, a lot of presented like, oh, Mosnet designed the Apple One computer, and actually that's sort of a phony concept because. Um, even without seeing Pop Electronics, not knowing anything about an Altair computer on the cover of Pop Electronics, not knowing anything about a TBT designed by anyone else, I had visited John Draper, Kenton Crunch in a garage once, and he's typed it on a teletype, saying, I'm talking to a machine in Boston, and I can switch to other computers in Berkeley and Stanford, and it was the ARPANET, forerunner of the internet. And I just looked at it and said, I've got to have that. And the only way to have things was to build them out of parts virtually for free in my own design and use my home TV, so I built a little terminal for it. And in those days, I optimized everything so tightly um, that the fastest modems that you could get would go 300 baud, that's 30 characters a second. 
So in trying to optimize my terminal, I designed it to do 60 characters a second, more than any terminal could do, more than any modem in the day could do, more than any teletype could do. So it was plenty fast, but by doing that, I was able to have little cheaper parts. And to me, everything in design was fewer parts or cheaper parts, with cheaper winning. And the cheapest parts were some little serial dynamic RAMs to hold the memory that was on your screen, the characters that were on your screen. So I had this terminal already. Then the idea came, why don't I whip it together instead of calling a computer in Boston, call a little microprocessor and some RAM right here and a little program I write, and then, and then I'll have a computer. So it was a, a little humble together out of a video terminal designed for one characteristics to build the computer. So you'd look at this computer and say, whoa, all it does is kind of print characters sort of slowly, only 60 a second. You know, um, it's not that impressive. Well, it wasn't really designed from the ground up to be a computer that had an intelligence, a processor, and a video. So uh, that's one of the reasons the Apple I is, was kind of hobbled together. The Apple II was really the first computer designed from the ground up, but it wasn't even designed to be a computer. Just started designing it as a colored TV generator and then used the signals to drive the computer. Yeah. You want to uh, talk about call computer, Randy? Oh, is yeah. another thing we did together? Uh, Apple II actually was followed was as long, right? That's one of the first things you ever taught me. Do it right the second time. <laughs> better, <laughs> better. No, you said do it right. Did you teach me right? Um, Call Computer is actually uh, was a uh, time sharing outfit that was uh, just a couple just a couple blocks from here actually. Old Middlefield. Uh, on Old Middlefield Road. Like, yeah. And uh, they contracted you to uh, design a terminal. Wasn't that uh, like computer? Uh, no, no. Actually, I had to build the terminal on my own to do the ARPANET stuff, and then Steve Jobs came by and said, let's sell it. Right. He said, in college, he said, let's sell the blue boxes. In the terminals, he said, let's sell the terminals. And then when it came to the Apple, he said, let's sell the computer. There you go. And uh, yeah, you can get into the Hoover Computer Club and your, um, yeah. your call computer. And you wrote the assembler. Yes, I wrote the uh, original assembler for uh, the Apple II. And uh, I mean, it was all running on uh, uh, timeshare computers back then, because nobody could afford a computer of our own. Right? We all had to share it. Remember that? I mean, the, the, to me, that's amazing that uh, back then, to have your own computer was just virtually unheard of. So that's why I started going to the Homebrew Computer Club. And you were the first one that uh, really made computers that people could get other than out there. <laughs> and some people hung around me at the Homebrew Computer Club saying, whoa, I can count the chips on this board. They're all cheap chips. How does he do it? But, you know, still, it was, a, it was sort of a subset because everybody was into the existing Altair, the, the uh, Intel chip computers of the day. Um, you know, we tried to be a, a little bit different, and really it was, uh, it was almost accidental. I'd already built my own, five years before I built my own machine with eight little switches for binary data and buttons to load up address registers and memory, and that's what the Altair was. It had 256 bytes of memory when you bought it stock, and that's what I very good. Well, after five years, you kind of want to move on to something else, and really working with Hewlett Packard was the biggest influence to try to make a computer more human, like with a keyboard that looks normal, looks like something people could understand and doesn't frighten the uh, novitiate away, and I look back, I didn't even think about it at the time, that it was all that important, it was just the cheaper, better way to do something was to build this thing with a little program that said, what are you typing on a keyboard? You could type in some commands that said, stuff this into memory, and it would happen. You didn't have to toggle switches and push buttons and move the open. It's really because it was cheaper, and um, you know, I look back at every computer before the Apple One had a front panel, every computer since has had a keyboard. So it was a big, um, a big important step. Yeah, uh, a lot of us uh, actually had experience outside of the Apple I and the Apple II uh, before I met Waz and Jobs and started working exclusively on the Apple I and Apple II. Uh, my best friend had a Cosmac. I used the Kim one. I almost took a job working uh, for the people at Kim down on um, down in San Jose. But uh, Scott Scott Boulevard in Santa Clara was too far to commute for me. Uh, because I only had a bicycle, and so Apple was a much better job opportunity because it was a half a mile away instead of uh, five miles on the bike. Um, when uh, my computer class in Steve Headley's class finally got a budget to uh, invest in microcomputers, um, I wanted, to, I got a lot of um, processor technology RAM cards and an S100 backplane and a Promemco Color Dazzler because they would pop for all of us, because all of the peripherals and the infrastructure and the, the ecosystem was all around the S100 bus. But I didn't know Intel machine code. Still don't even know we're shipping Intel machines now. Um, okay, I, I toggled in the color dazzler bootstrap on an altar at least once. Uh, but, and ran, and uh, I, I also toggled in the, the um, I punched, I, I have to admit it, I punched duplicate copies of Altair Basic. 
Bill Gates still hates me for doing that. But I found this company that was building 6502 board, CPU boards for the S100 bus. And so I built this thing for high school, spent thousands of dollars of the high school's money on a 6502 based um, S100 bus machine with a um, touch tape punch, punch and reader, reader and processor tech, memory processor tech board, never worked. Never worked at all, and there was no software available for the 6502, um, except, except in the Apple ecosystem, and that's uh, where we were, with the incompatible processor for all of history. I, I, I completely forgot about a college computer. Uh, that was the other, that was, the, that was actually the other first job I had that summer. Yeah, Alex I had, Hamrad. Yes, uh, so I had come out in June of 76, and Steve was graciously trying to help me find work. There wasn't that much to do with the Apple one. And so he got me a job with Call Computer, for working hourly for 350 an hour, I think, assembling modems. And I didn't even know until later. I think you designed that modem, did yes. you not? Yes, I did not. Well, it was all analog. Uh, yeah, years. I don't take credit for designing. It was sort of out of the data sheet of, a, of one of the companies that made something. Yeah, so that, that, I, I didn't know anything about modems. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know how to. It was all I could do to just learn the resistor code to <laughs> solder them together. Uh, Alex was quite a character. Maybe that's what I've said about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I also remember in our home for computer club, Randy was assigned the job of setting up a Tuesday night chat chat X session, for, it was free to all the Homebrew Computer Club members. Oh, yeah. So, and so I went on and I to analyze the program. It was written in basic, and it, as soon as it was, it, it always grabbed this file called chat X that you would type into, and then everybody else who was online would read what you had typed. So I just wrote a program to sit there, wait until chat X was free, grab the file, and dump nine pages of Polish jokes into it. <laughs> <laughs> Every minute I would say, what is wrong with chat X? It just needs that your jokes at me, Randy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I remember at Apple, I got hired by uh, Steve Jobs for uh, three dollars an hour, and for programming. And uh, the only way I finally made a raise is that I gave us a shortcut through to Seven uh, Eleven. Uh, Waz was tired of walking all the way around the fence, so I actually cut a hole through the fence. <laughs> he came in one day and found a bunch of boards on his desk, and uh, my pay rate went up after that. <laughs> So when we started putting together the, um, the Apple IIs, when we got our first building, uh, I remember like the, the night before we formally took possession, Waz and Randy and I went over there. Uh, there was no furniture in it. Half of the building was carpeted, and half the building was linoleum. The carpeted half was sales and marketing, and the linoleum part was engineering and manufacturing. Uh, and the only thing that was installed were the telephones. Now, when you're in a building, with nothing but telephones in it, and Steve Wozniak. <laughs> you, know that, you know that you're gonna have some fun, and basically we, we played this game of tag, running around the room, buzzing each other on the, the PBX system, and, and trying to uh, buzz the phone that the other guy was on before he could buzz you back. And it was you know, like a, a somewhat grown-ups game of electronic tag. Um, and then it got populated, there were lab benches, and there were desks, and there was Steve's desk, and there was um, uh, Dana Reddington's desk, and what the hell happened to all those people? But, um, and uh, then, you know, started getting the cases for the Apple II, and getting ready for the first West Coast Computer Fair, and we hired Mike Scott, who was president of the company, and uh, he decided that, uh, having a uh, loose leaf report cover technical reference manual was inadequate, so one day he and um, uh, Sherry Livingston, I guess it was, gathered together everything that they could find out of anybody's, tech, anybody's desk drawer that looked technical, and took it down to PIP printing and had it printed and bound, you know, uh, consistent or not, accurate or not, whatever, and that was the first uh, red book, the Apple II reference manual. Uh, and we had a lot of problems back in those days with you know simple manufacturing stuff. And there's a copy of it. I remember the Burnley sockets drove us nuts. Uh, you know, we almost didn't do socketed stuff. Together. And Apple documentation never got any better. Oh no, it never. Did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my biggest problems with the original uh, Apple II keyboard was 
it extended about an inch beyond the, the lip of the case. So if you lifted up the case too much, it would pop the keyboard right out of the case, right out of the screws. And the summer of 77, we had this huge problem with electrostatic discharge. Whenever you'd walk across the, the uh, carpet, if you touched an open case of an Apple II, you fried the keyboard chip. Yep. And we were replacing keyboard chips all the time. Good, I'll get back to that one. We had, we had actually, um, our documentation for those days got you to understand the computer down to the lowest level of chips, and so many people like to learn from it. Um, I hear a lot of good stories from that. But um, yeah, the Apple I originally, <coughs> it came back on quickly. I already had a video terminal that I designed and built. I wanted to combine a microprocessor with it. And these Intel microprocessors were rumored to be 400 bucks. You know, my apartment rental was 300, 400 bucks for a processor. I could never afford that. And then I found out I could get a, motor, a Motorola 6800 for $40 as a Hewlett Packard employee. So the board is actually designed and has the nomenclature for a 6800 chip. Then the MOS technology 6502 came out for $20, 25 bucks. And it was pin for pin electrically compatible with the 6800 that I had done all of my drafting of the designs of the computer. So I said, whoa, I can use this one because it's easy to buy. I don't have to go down to a parts distributor that wants me to fill out all these forms like I'm a company with people who, you know, PO numbers and people who have officers in the company and all these credit reports that just don't apply to a normal person who has a $20 bill. I could go down to the Westcon show and pay a $20 bill over the counter and Chuck Peddle himself handed back a 9605 microprocessor and five bucks for a manual and drove home up. It was so exciting and easy to put that together. That there were two chips, a 6501 and a 6502. The 6501, like the Motorola 1600, needed higher uh, power, faster clocking circuits built out of transistors with a little higher voltage and all that. And I still have the parts on the board since it was designed for a 1600 anyway. So you could actually plug in a few little transistors and resistors and all that, and a 6501 would save five bucks. But um, you know, we went with the, uh, the better choice. Another yeah, good choice. choice that we made was Dynamic Rams came out that year, 1960-75. I'm at the Homebrew Computer Club, and first of all, the electronics magazines I'm reading, Bill Packard, the, the 4K Dynamic RAM is the first time ever that silicon RAM is going to be cheaper than magnetic core memory. And you can see the future. All of a sudden, that is the right way to go. But every single one of the hobby computer kits being built, every single one bar none, used the 2104 static RAM. Four times more expensive, 2102, whatever it was. Four times more expensive, four times as many chips, and I always tried to reduce cost and reduce chips, and they, I guess they just didn't want to figure out how to design refresh circuits, you know? But to me, the, I was an engineer, and the goal was how do you design it with the fewest parts? So I, I bought some, I bought, there were three companies that came out with the 4K Dynamic RAM. AMI, some Texas company, either MOSFET or TI, and Intel. And Intel, of course, would be so expensive, forget it. I looked at all the data sheets and loved that Intel one. Oh, the chips were TTL compatible, they were fewer pins, smaller packages, and even though you had to put in a little bit extra circuitry to feed half the address and then the other half, it turns out that um, I measured circuit complexity by the number of pins, and the number of pins still wound up being less, so it was a better chip, but I couldn't afford anything from Intel, so I didn't even look that way. I bought at the club, I bought eight AMI chips, probably from some employee of AMI, first I never ran, built in my refresh circuits and actually got it working on the Apple One. I could bring it down to the Homebrew Computer Club and demonstrate something that now only had eight chips for 4K of RAM. And that was another way to kind of impress people because back then I couldn't talk to anyone unless they were impressed with my work. And uh, as funny as it sounds, so uh, anyway, Steve Jobs called up, what about the Intel ones? I said, well, it's Intel, it'd be too expensive. He says, what if I can get them for free? Well, he could talk his way into anything, basically. <laughs> the rules, yeah, the rules didn't apply, <laughs> and he still can't. And then he just called a rep, um, he told me, and, and got eight, got 16 chips of the Intel ones. So we got on the right path for the RAMs that were really going to be the future of RAMs, the ones that were going to evolve over time. I recently ran to somebody who said, oh, actually, uh, Gordon Moore knew Steve's father and gave the RAMs. So I don't know what the true story is. <laughs> Steve never quite lets on his sources of things like, like, where did the name Apple come from? And, that sort of stuff. Uh, the, Apple, the Apple logo that was on the Apple One manual was drawn by Ron Wayne. When we started the company, Steve and I decided to have 45% each and give Ron Wayne, a fellow that Steve had met at Atari, 10% because Ron kind of had instant answers to everything. He was one of these arch conservative guys who read all these books like None Dare Call Trees. So he had instant answers to everything. I thought, wow, that's a good guy to answer any disputes between us. He's so smart. He could sit down the typewriter and type out the legalese that only lawyers knows. Know with all the legal words, and uh, he drew the he 
he actually drew the, um, the etching on our apple manual, at Newton under the apple tree. Uh, he wrote the entire manual, and eventually when we were getting parts of 30 days credit, building computers in the garage, driving them down to the store and getting paid cash in 10 days, when we had 30 days credit on the parts, he got worried that if we ever didn't get paid, Steve had no money, no bank account, no car. I had no money, no bank account, no car. They'd have to come to him and get his gold nuggets or something. So he might have made a statistically an intelligent decision to sell out this 10% of Apple for a few hundred bucks. And that was Ron Wayne. And you know, I'm sure he doesn't regret it. I mean, you make a decision at the time that turn out wrong doesn't mean that they were the wrong decision. So any more Apple One stories? Or? I, think, I think people have tried to look at Ron Wayne. Oh, yeah, yeah, he couldn't delete it. Oh, really? Yeah, he yeah, popped up one day. He and I and Steve Jobs were all at Apple, and I had a camera in my pocket. Pulled it out, and we took a picture, and I didn't have, and it didn't have a battery or something. Uh, I looked later, and I had no picture. No, maybe it was no memory card, something stupid like that. <laughs> Too bad. It would have been a great picture. It was down at Apple. Yeah. Well, I remember going over to Ron Wayne's house with Steve Jobs. He also was the one who was, who, his name is on the schematic. Well, so you had a hand-drawn schematic, and he did a hand No, 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 no. I did hand-drawing, and then I did, I did the, um, the actual, I did the actual drafting of Bill Packard, drafting of all of our schematics, Apple one, Apple two. Sometimes they would get redone by other people later, maybe for a manual, but um, there wasn't any real reason for it. Until his name was on it. Yeah, I was noticing his name was on it. Like Ron Wayne. Well, yeah. he was in charge of our manual. You know, Ron Wayne had another interesting talent, which was he was building pendulum clocks out of cardboard. Do you remember that? He had a kit to make clocks where every part of it was out of cardboard, which now when I think of it, it reminds me of one of Jeff Raskin's hobbies. Well, that sort of thing about Ron Wendell was so impressive that Steve and I took him as an equal partner. He had all these little, you know, he could just about make anything out of nothing. That sort of, that sort of people would kind of surprise you with their abilities and talents. Yeah, speaking of surprising with their abilities and talents, I'll never forget driving up to Homebrew Computer Club with you early. Chris and I were the ones that had to carry the TV. Um, and uh, you would sit there before the meeting and type in uh, integer basic in hex. I mean, he would, he would literally be typing with one hand, turning the page with the other hand. You type it in for, uh, I guess, about an, an hour, something like that. And that was the origins of the uh, cassette interface. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, typing the basic in, well, it's, um, one of the stories is all of the, I could not afford an assembler. There was an online assembler that you could dial in with a terminal and a modem, and you could actually, um, you could actually type a 6502 assembly language program in and have it compile it and tell you what the ones and zeros were. Well, in my case, since I couldn't afford that, I just wrote the program on the right-hand side of a sheet of paper, and I hand wrote the ones and zeros, the hexadecimal on the left side, and sometimes you get wrong trying to guess. It's probably about 30 bytes ahead, so I'll put in hexadecimal for a jump of 30, and then I'll go back later and correct it. And um, wrote the entire thing, everything by hand, all the way up to every bit of code that's in the Apple II was never run through an assembler by that point in time. So, which is kind of unusual. I look back at it, I still got those manuals, and um, the cassette tape interface saved me a lot of time because I would sit typing about 4K of basic in, it would take me about 40 minutes during the Homebrew Computer Club meeting, so once I got it in, I could actually run basic. Don't ask me how I could type that accurately, that much data. But then design the cassette tape interface to use a normal cassette tape, because everything I had to use had to be virtually for free. I could never afford some kind of commercial tape unit like a Hewlett Packard would have gone with. And, um, and so a little cassette tape unit, you know, all it did was put out you know, pulses of different frequencies and measure what came back from the tape, and it worked. And so it was almost a forerunner of the floppy disk interface. The uh, important thing about uh, Steve's cassette interface is that it only worked on cheap recorders. There was a Radio Shack model that was uh, Apple, Apple recommended, and if you tried to use it on a good quality cassette recorder, it wouldn't work, but on the, uh, it's always going with cheap parts, in this case, only with cheap parts. Yeah, I never heard that, but I thought it worked. We sold a lot of Apple Ones and Apple Twos, even Apple Two came out originally with the cassette tape interface only, and boy, all the numbers of companies have spun up putting out tapes, you walk into a store and there's an Apple II, and a whole ton of tapes of mostly games, but uh, it really made us look big, like, you know, you see all these accessories for the iPod, it makes you look like a bigger part of the world and more substantial. Now, it took a lot of work to do that, because um, in uh, early 77, uh, when we were you know, on a growth curve uh, shipping Apple Ones and then Apple IIs, uh, we didn't have a tape duplicator. And the way to duplicate the, the system software 
for the Apple II, which was the, the set of basic games that we shipped, um, was a, a rack of Panasonic cassette tape machines all run off the same Apple II. And the way you do it is you type in the command to dump the program to tape. And somebody had designed this octopus um, audio splitter that went out of the cassette out jack and went to all of the tape. And then you had to press play and record on all of the tape machines simultaneously and then return on the keyboard. And anybody who had some spare moments and was available in the room was supposed to start and stop the tape duplication whenever they could. And when somebody would come in to talk to um, you know, Mike Scott about like a $25 million line of credit at Bank of America or, or opening up new distributorships or something like that, he would interrupt the meeting, go, go up, pop the tapes out, put in new blank tapes, start it up again, and go back and say, okay, now what we were saying. <laughs> and, and, and that was the kind of environment it was. There, it was, I, I don't want to say it was an ego-free environment because there were massive egos, but nobody had a pride investment in, I don't do that, that's not my job. Uh, everybody was pulling together and doing whatever it took to get stuff done, and people would do multiple jobs um, just to move the company forward. And it wasn't, it's not like they were moving the company forward. It was like moving the, the product forward, moving the Apple One, moving the Apple Two forward. And it was just a, an, an inspiring environment. And when we were showing off the Apple One, even at the PC76 show, we had the Apple Two design. It was a three month design. It came up very, very quickly, but we were keeping kind of secret about it. As far as Apple I, how did we sell? Steve Jobs used to get on the phone, call up the stores that were opening around the country, and there weren't too many, probably just a couple of dozen cities that had computer stores, and he would tell them what we had and what price and send them some brochures that they wanted and work business that way. One time, I was driving in Southern California. I popped into a store, I, saw, I, I drove by it, I think I saw the name, I didn't know about it in advance, a computer store in Orange, California. And I walked in, talked to the guy, showed him an Apple One board, and told him what it did. And, and uh, he sat down and he said, well, he was thinking about opening up this display of a whole bunch of Apple Ones playing the game. I showed him playing Star Trek off of cassette tape. And he would set it up, and he, he bought about 20 Apple Ones, and he had all these stations he could come in and rent time and play Star Trek on it, which was a text-based game. And th that was the sort of way we made sales back then. So, do you think that, was that, was that related to the Orange Computer Company, which I remember. Nope. nope. I don't nope. remember the nope. nope. Not related. It's yeah. Orange Computer. Anyway, so on the same subject, uh, I have to say, one of my most vivid memories of the summer of 76 is when you would show up at the garage and with a new version of BASIC, and Steve Jobs would read it off the page and you would touch type, like a maniac, just type with typing in the house, which just completely amazed me. I didn't. Another uh, great design characteristic of the Apple One was the uh, area where you could uh, put in the parts that were uh, identified and you would have an RF modulator, but we weren't allowed to uh, create and sell one of our own, right, because of uh, FCC rules? No, we had no RF modulator built on the board. No, right. the parts you could build in were only for clocking a, a 6800 style chip that needed better clocks. We wouldn't, when we came out with the Apple II, we had to think that was for, when we came out with the Apple II, um, you needed a way to get it into your television set, and televisions didn't have video in. I just unscrewed the back of my set, looked at the schematic, probed with an oscilloscope, and found where the video went, built a transistor inverter to get my video into my home TV. But um, the way to get it in would be to broadcast it on a channel, like Channel 3 or Channel 34 or whatever. Some of the early VCRs were um, out, I think, at that time, and that's how they were doing it. But uh, I was a ham radio operator, and we're supposed to protect the purity of the waves, and. How do you know what you're allowed to transmit, what you don't, when there's no law? So I wouldn't let Apple build a, a modulator. It's really against it. And they worked a sneaky agreement behind my back to just funnel this other guy the, uh, the shipment rates of our Apple IIs and the circuit for, yeah, Marty Spurgell made the M&R Supermod modulator to get it on TV sets. Yeah, I was um, just afraid of trans, you know, going, of being one of those guys that puts out waves that disturb. The airwaves should be clean and pure, so they work well. They work well. When somebody comes out with a product that puts out bad frequencies or, or too much power, really all of the formulas for what makes radio work go downhill. Now, even though the, um, the Apple I was revolutionary in its time because you had the opportunity of buying one assembled and tested by Dan Kofke, um, <laughs> And if you wanted a, uh, an Altair or an Insight, you had to uh, just get the parts and put them together yourself, although some people would, 
would uh, sell you the services of assembling it for you and, and having soldered together a couple of processor technology, 4K by uh, 4 RAM boards, uh, it was certainly worth the money. But uh, even when you got the Apple I uh, assembled and tested, you remember you just got the bare board. There was no case, there was no keyboard. No and well, the, well, there was the power supply circuitry, but you had to supply your own power transformers. You had to go out and buy the two transformers, wire them to 110 yourself, and wire them up to the Molex connector to plug into the board. Um, a lot of people, I on my own, I couldn't find the Molex connector, so I just soldered the uh, leads right to the um, right to the um, the diodes that were the uh, the full wave rectifier bridge uh, on the board. And I, I still remember the smell when I burned out a diode by by putting it in backwards. Uh, those those things stick with you. Uh, and so. It, putting together the Apple One was, it, it was, you had to go pick up the things in various places. And I remember my first keyboard, uh, Waz and Jobs gave me the, uh, the bare board and let me populate it myself, but I still needed the keyboard. And I remember getting, I remember getting my first keyboard for my Apple One uh, in the parking lot of the bike shop in Santa Clara, somewhere in, in like the fall of 1976, I was talking with this guy and I had written a couple of programs on the Apple One with, that were demos, and he said, uh, okay, uh, you give me that program, and I think I got a keyboard in my trunk. So he went out of his car, and he opened his trunk, and he had an 8-bit ASCII. Uh, it was um, positive going left, not negative going left, so I needed to wire in an inverter on the breadboard area in order to make it work. Uh, and then I had my keyboard, and then I, could, um, then I could use my Apple One. I didn't have any case for it, though. But at school, there was a cardboard box that I picked up in the computer lab. And so for the rest of that year, I carried around my Apple I in a punch card box labeled IBM. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Well, that, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mentioned that we, I gave the first Apple I to Liza. Well, Steve and I agreed to both, both give, and I didn't have to pay this time, uh, our first Apple II or one of our first ones to Chris at Homestead High School, because we had both attended Homestead High School. Subject of the cases, I can remember going to see carpenters with Steve Jobs to look at guys who would make some wooden cases for us. And I remember uh, some guy promoting this great Goa wood that he wanted to use to make the cases out of, or teak. Uh, the, the one th of the slide, I had never seen that one before. I'm not, I'm not positive, but I believe that was uh, built by my brother when he was unemployed over summer. And uh, he was just looking for something to do. And original case for my prototype, hand soldered, hand wired, Apple I and Apple II actually, those cases were wooden ones made by a Randy's either father or brother, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. And Steve Headley at Homestead, who ran the wood shop as well as computer lab, uh, and somewhat interchangeably, uh, <laughs> he also did some wooden cases for Apple II, and I've always been under the impression that that's one of his, but I didn't know about his brother, so it could very well be that one. Um, so I, I remember Mark went to Homestead sometime in the uh, early 80s and said, if you've got old Apple stuff here, and Headley produced, you know, a, a pre-product, a hand-built Apple one and a pre-production Apple II, uh, whose logic board wasn't even solder mask. It was white, it wasn't green. And said, oh yeah, I've got these around. I mean, somebody brought them in, it was me. Um, and he gave them to Markle, and Markle gave them to the Smithsonian. So, it was cool. Cool, let's see. Um, that's Apple One, yeah. It was. Um, what do you What do you guys think made Apple the the success, the breakthrough success? What made Apple the breakthrough success? I think the world was waiting for the right combination of things. Um, I, I think um, the fancifulness had aspect of a computer had come into being, and I think a keyboard helped that. Color helped it. Games helped it. And also the marketing was probably harder. I think it's a lot easier. I don't want credit for starting uh, the, the whole world on the homebrew computers. I just want the credit for designing a good one. Um, Steve Jobs and Mike Markula really had all the ideas of communicating to the public why a computer can do things for you, that it can be valuable in the home. And yes, it can do your recipe, it can store your recipes, and it can uh, uh, help manage your checkbook and all this. And it's not really so much where the world for personal computers came. What we had, the, it was sort of the vision was 
this is the product that will do it all, but really it was quite a step. Um, you know, other products and other markets that came along really made it as big as it was. But um, so, uh, you know, it was really trying to, but it's still, publicizing the fact that a computer could look attractive and attract the people at a home and, you know, people in their home together can actually use a product was a, a big part of it. Yeah, I think uh, I think Steve Jobs had a lot to do with that. I mean, he learned that from Mike Markle and it's sort of keep him doing the same thing, making, making technology that's easy for people to use. Because, I mean, Chris, you know, you've heard all these horror stories about how hard it was to build your own computer. That was totally true. I actually built an Apple One, which we never got running because I was so bad with the soldering iron. No, I, came over, I came over and soldered it. We did get run. But it broke very shortly there. Oh. Uh, um, but I mean, it was just so hard to get something working. And uh, Apple was the first one that really sort of packaged it all together where a relatively normal person uh, would be able to get it going. They wouldn't be able to store their recipes on it. We never did that. We did, we did checkbook balancing, and I don't think anyone ever successfully used it other than Mike Markle and myself. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, also, this was back in the days when you know, we didn't have, of course, we had hardware that failed. Ships would go bad in the Apple One because you could touch them with the static would zap the processor or some PMOS RAMs, and I didn't have some uh, uh, TTL input pull downs that would cause them to be flaky. But um, the Apple Two, the processor is about the only thing you could zap with static. But, um, the keyboard. And the keyboard but still, right. yeah, still, yeah, the keyboard. But we still had basically no hardware or software bugs ever that I heard of either of those products. So I, I think when you hand write the code, you are so close to it in your mind all the time, so close to it, there's higher reliability way of developing software. Was there any moments when you guys uh, thought Apple wouldn't make it? All of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> well, uh, but just to backtrack a little bit, on the, uh, on the subject of back in the garage, I, I think the week I arrived in 76, Steve Jobs' father had just built burn-in box. I had no idea what this was. It was a coffin-shaped box set of plywood that the Apple Ones maybe would hold 10 Apple Ones, and you would power them up and let them run overnight. And so that was actually one of my first jobs was taking, putting them in, burning them in, and taking them out and testing them. And, uh, and then, uh, so I, when I finally transitioned from Apple production into Apple engineering, in 78, that was my first job in engineering, was to build a modular burn-in rack test system for the Apple II boards. And on the subject of failures, the thing that plagued us at the time was that you would burn in the Apple II boards and the, the little monolithic 0.1 microfarad capacitors would sometimes short out during the burn-in and the power supply wouldn't shut off and so the whole boards would get, uh, the boards would get burned up. The box. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe you never saw that. That was actually the worst failures that, that I ever saw in my year in, in production at Apple. So uh, back to your question, were there times I thought Apple would make it? Uh, there were two main times I can remember. One was uh, the night that uh, Steve Jobs called everybody that uh, Woz knew and said, you've got to get Steve to do this company. He's, he, he doesn't want to do it. He wants to stay at HP. He wants to move to Corvallis. And uh, you gotta, you got to tell them that you know, doing this company is the right thing. I'm sure you remember that now. Um, and the other is when we were doing the uh, disk drive in uh, Las Vegas and worked all night. And in the morning, I backed it up the wrong direction and destroyed um, quite a few hours of work. I think I was the one who backed it up the wrong way. Well, um, yeah, there was also a time when we came with the Apple II. This is not Apple I related stuff. but. Um, yeah, the Apple II, and uh, our sales went up right away. We started selling them into all the stores after the West Coast Computer Fair introduction. And uh, after a while, time, we were starting to pile up a bunch of boxes in our one building, our one facility, and people could see, you know, dozens of computers that weren't shipped, weren't sold yet. It, it's like all of a sudden marketing, you know, instead of engineering having, having the, um, the monkey, all of a sudden it was marketing you had to get to selling them. But around that time, we came out with the floppy disk drive, and VisiCalc showed up, and then the world went bananas, and we couldn't keep up with it for quite a long time. Um, yeah, uh, I never really thought Apple wouldn't make it. Now, I did, I felt it was just out of my own integrity. I was gonna be myself, and wasn't gonna be pushed around, influenced by big business, and by money, and stuff like that in my life. And I made up my mind, and yeah, I did, I, you know, I had designed two computers, cassette tape interfaces, uh, written all this software, I'd written a basic, done all this stuff, moonlighting from Hewlett Packard. Five turndowns from Hewlett Packard, by the way. 
And I figured, you know, God, I can just keep doing that when we start Apple. I'll just keep moonlighting, and if it doesn't go, I've still got my job for life at HP. And I love designing computers so much and helping the world, you know, get advanced, but I could do that on my own time. So yeah, I did say no to Steve Jobs and Mike Markowitz for, for starting the real corporation, the real Apple II, moving out of the garage. Uh, moving into the garage, it was another ethical consideration. Steve said, why don't we sell some PC ports? See, the whole idea wasn't even to have a computer company. It was just to sell components, PC ports. Steve had worked in surplus stores like Caltech and selling parts, you know, buying them cheap and selling them expensive or for, for more. And, um, and that was, <laughs> and so, so it wasn't really like we were even selling computers. Good God, I was passing out the schematics and circuits to the Apple I. I'm sure there's no IP violation on these Apple I replicas. Um, they were, you know, we didn't even put uh, copyright notices on them to back at home for computer club days. So, um, um, so anyway, uh, so Steve Wan didn't really want to start a computer company, but I said, wait, first of all, I think anything I design belongs to my company, HP, you know, and, um, and I've used their parts, and so I went to HP, and we had a big meeting to do a computer that could run in basic, let you type your own programs in, let you type games in, let you type solutions to work, and watch it on your RCA television. And one of the answers came back was, well, Hewlett Packard has to build finely controlled products that are guaranteed to work for engineers who expect professional equipment. Our, our, our only consumer product really was the calculator. And what if the television set didn't show the picture well? Was it the television's problem? Was it Hewlett Packard's problem? Those kind of issues HP did not want to ever get into. They only wanted to deliver 100% reliable, sure working uh, program according to the specs. So they didn't go with the Apple One. When I got an order for, was Steve, Steve Jobs called me up one day and he had an order for $50,000. 100 fully built computers, we'd be paid $500 each from the bike shop. Now that was a shock, because $50,000 is more than twice my annual salary at Hewlett Packard as an engineer. So I went to Hewlett Packard's legal department and made them cycle uh, a description of our product to every single Hewlett Packard division to make sure that I wouldn't thought they wouldn't come back and accuse me of doing something wrong, you know, doing something wrong for the sake of money or your own company is something I could never do. And then um, let's see, what was another Hewlett Packard eventually started building a computer on my floor of our calculator lab. And it had a microprocessor, and it had some dynamic memory, and it had a little video screen, black and white, and it had a keyboard, a human keyboard. You could type programs in basic, and they had five people assigned to writing the basic, and it had a tape drive, and I'd done cassette tape. All these things I had just done, but I didn't care. I, I went to the, the director, and I said, of the project, and I said, my life isn't calculated. My life has always been about computers. I want to be on this Capricorn project. I'll do anything. I'll do a printer interface. I don't have to do you know any major role in it. Or, you know, I want to do it, and they turned me down again for that one. So, but Hewlett Packard, if they had bought the Apple, the Apple idea, it never would have happened. They never would have done a product that would have inspired normal people. All the people that were outside of the uh, professional engineering industry, all the people that never came around computers, the dentists, the teachers, the lawyers, the, the sort of people that really um, Apple was going to open up the uh, window for. People have been predicting the imminent demise of Apple Computer for as long as there's been an Apple Computer. And given uh, Silicon Valley and high-tech firms and startups in general, uh, odds on that you're right when you predict the imminent demise of a startup company. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what and how many things we did right. Uh, we had a consumer-oriented, humanist-oriented approach to a uh, high-tech area, and that was, uh, that was audacious. Not a lot of people were doing that. Uh, when high-tech companies got into consumer products, it, it was like um, Intel with their Micron Cub division with their watch. Did anybody ever have one of Intel's original digital watches there? No, you can't raise your arm that far if you ever own one of those. <laughs> um, and, and part of it was just getting lucky and being in the right place in the right time. Um, but there were odds against us from the very beginning. Uh, and some of the very engineering decisions that made our products excellent also branded us for life and, and giving us some struggles. Uh, if you go to the Smithsonian Institution into the Information Age exhibit, when you get to the point where there's the school classroom scene with the Apple I and the Apple II on the desk, behind it on the blackboard, written so that you can't take a picture of these machines without getting this in the shot, is the word incompatible. <laughs> and from the very beginning, by picking the 6502 instead of the 8080, people said Apple was incompatible, no S100 bus, 
no 8080 instruction set, no uh, infrastructure support, you can't interchange peripherals, um, that by being incompatible with the rest of the industry, Apple is always going to be in a weaker position and something is always going to come along to knock it off. And the number of Apple One killers, I mean, of course the S100 bus was going to beat the Apple One, right? And then when the Apple II came along, well, the Commodore Pet was going to beat the Apple II and the uh, K-Pro was going to beat the Apple II. And the, I mean, I remember we were at First West Coast Computer Fair, we looked at the Sphere and thought, gee, that is a wicked machine. That's just gonna, who ever heard of the Sphere? And look where you are, and look at look who you are. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, so we, you know, from the very beginning, uh, we knew, and I think this was something that Markle brought, is that he knew the dynamics of high tech and of shakeouts and how to survive a shakeout. And Jobs was a master marketer who knew how to sell, you know, ice cubes to Eskimos. And we had a great product that once you got to use it, people just loved using it. I mean, I always always said that I loved the um, Apple One because it had um, advanced consumer design because it came pre-soldered, and it had a revolutionary user interface because you could type your programs in in hexadecimal instead of toggling them in in binary. Um, and for 1976, that was an advanced user interface. Um, but just being a little ahead of the curve on the human factors of it and knowing how to keep a company alive uh, when a lot of other companies are going to fail for one reason or another, um, and I think that's what did it. Now, I'm a lot more bullish at it. Right from the start, just having the, the technology and the better technology was more important, especially Apple One type days. And we could just, the Apple One was one set of chips that was affordable, that was a complete computer that you could type programs into. By the time you added all the pieces to any other computer to type programs into, you were out so much money. Where would you find the input device? The teletype, the input output. Yeah. Um, it was just too way too expensive. So, cost-wise, even the Apple One was there, and the Apple Two was just so far ahead with features no one ever imagined. You know, it would become the small computers, and it was out of the box usable. And we priced it high deliberately because Mike Markula knew that we, you know, had to have a high profit margin to grow a company because the stress of growing and you know expanding and selling more units every month cost a lot of money and you gotta have the high profit margin. So our sold for more than the, the Commodore Pet, but the Pet you got, you know, a really limited basic computer that really wasn't expandable. And people with computers, it's like iPods. You want to be able to buy new stuff and plug it in and try new things out all the time. And we had our bus with the slots you could plug cards in, we could develop a floppy disk eventually. Um, we had enough RAM that you could write an operating system. We had enough RAM that you could um, run physic out when when it came out and changed the world. So really it was Accidental things that we hadn't really intended or thought about or talked about in advance, but uh, by having such a full computer, we were able to move with the markets as they evolved and developed. Whereas Radio Shack and Commodore had to go back to the drawing board with their early entries. And those were the only other two low cost computers that really at least did some right things. They had engineers, they had dynamic memory, so they had the cost figure on the RAM writing. So, where did this 666 price come from? Yeah, Steve came up with this uh, order for 100 computers, Apple Ones, fully built board. That means the computers you still had to assemble. You had to hook all the wires from a keyboard up. You had to get a keyboard. You had to buy some transformers at Radio Shack and wire the power in. You had to take the video output and get it into a monitor of some sort. So the Apple One wasn't really out of the box, just use it. It wasn't ready, what I would call a real personal computer for the masses. It was still for technical hobbyists. And we had, the price was $500 that we'd be paid by the bike shop of Palo Alto or whatever, wherever it was. And Steve said, well, what do we, what do we put, put for a retail price? Well, at about a third. That makes it 667 And then I thought, and I was into repeating digits because of my uh, great phone numbers in my life. I've collected a lot of great repeating digit phone numbers. And I, my first dialer joke at 255-6666. I said, let's make it 666. And they said, no, 666, 666. It's all the same digit. Yeah, neither one of us had ever heard of, uh, you know, 666 being a number of the beast. So other people told us that and we laughed. <laughs> so kind of, kind of surprising in retrospect that uh, Paul Terrell of Bike Shop didn't want to double his wholesale cost for the retail price. I don't know. We never talked to Paul Terrell about what we should list on our advertising as a retail price. We were just selling it to him at his price. But he yeah. sold them for six. He just, yeah, he was a little bit um, satisfied. He was the one that 
um, and told me later years that yeah, Steve came by his store, and, and he and Paul had been down at the Homebrew Computer Club. He'd been watching me with the machine, and, and he saw that it was sort of a complete machine that could be built. And when he really ordered it from Steve, he wanted complete, ready to pull out of the box and use machines. Uh, and he said to Steve that, that he, people don't want to come in the store and buy kits anymore. They, so he's got technicians in the back room wiring up the kits into fully built computers, and people come in the store, they want to buy something fully built. So he was a little bit dissatisfied. He even had to look up the Apple One a little more. He like, thought was, he wasn't quite getting what he had really ordered. Um, I didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't feel that. Yeah. Well, so on the subject of what made the Apple II so successful, what comes to mind, of course, is the plastic case, the Jerry Man design, and the lightweight and switching power supply that Ron Holt contributed. And, and what people also often say is the extendable slots. Now, there was some debate between you and Steve Jobs about the slot architecture, right? Do you, do you remember that? Well, remember, Steve wasn't really a, a technical engineer type person, he never wrote a line of code. So, uh, you know, I was around computers my whole life. You plug in lots of boards, and it's like plugging in those elements of a hi fi. You want, always want to add things to a computer. And I come up with a really clever scheme for pre decoding addresses to each slot. Because to me, every piece of hardware now was going to be software plus hardware. So a range of addresses meant that a slot could have a little bit of code in ROM to run a program and do its stuff. So it didn't have to be pure hardware. That saved a lot of chips. Well, I had come up with this clever scheme that one chip would decode eight sets of addresses at once for eight slots. And another chip would decode a different set of eight addresses. And that was so clever. Two chips was doing all this work that when you bought parts for the S100 systems, you had to have toggle switches to toggle in the address you wanted that board to respond to, like A, B, or 7, 8. Toggle in the address, and then it had comparator chips on the board, and by the time you plugged in eight boards, you'd wind up with about 40 chips, you know, that where I had done everything in two chips. Steve said, let's, let's just build a machine. All people want is a printer and a modem. Well, that was all that was visible to him. And, uh, you know, and I, that was a ridiculous idea to me, and I just said, uh, no, we're gonna have eight chips, or get your own computer. My real motivation was I had this clever design for eight chips. Why would I throw it away and not even save one chip? I mean, if he could have said, well, you could save a chip, then I might have thought <laughs> twice. <laughs> so, and, and that is really funny. It's, it's how the past is eternally present. There's this big debate about why the new Core 2 Duo MacBook Pros can only go up to 3 gig of RAM and not go up to 4 gig of RAM. And it's the same reason that an Apple II went up to 48K instead of 64K, because we needed the top order of the memory for memory map I.O. Okay, oh, I think we're probably about done. Maybe I'm going to do question and answer. Yeah, I think uh, let's uh, do question and answer. Yeah, for so uh, th I want to thank the, the uh, panel for this incredible journey. And then we'll give them a hand, and then we'll start the, uh, the story period.